Okay, here I am. So let's, uh, uh, even for currents, let's take a simplified approach, an empirical approach, which is based uh, on decomposing uh, the resultant forces on the ship uh, into one horizontal force in the longitudinal direction and another in the transversal direction and uh, a vertical axis moment, uh, vertical axis moment, uh, which uh, takes into account the rotation that is originated by currents over the ship. Uh, and all of them, all of these forces uh, and moment uh, are applied uh, at the ship's uh, center of uh, gravity. Okay. Uh, Let's look at this uh, at this um, relationship. I just wanted to draw your attention on what's written here, which is what I mentioned before. Before it is recommended to make sure that the berth front is directed as parallel as possible to the prevailing current, and since the direction of the current can vary, it is also necessary to assess over a long time period the current perpendicular to the direction of the birth front and if such a component reaches a value of about uh, uh, 0.5 uh, uh, meters per second which is uh, the velocity the birthing operation would be very difficult and uh, so you have to take into account uh, in a way not only the main current direction but also the other directions because this indication which is given here i think it is an important rule of thumb i am selecting it uh, so let's now have a look at this uh, empirical relationship again they are given by the spanish standard and uh, here you see the three relationship for uh, transversal component, longitudinal component, and rotational moment. And the, the first is the transversal component. Here we have again uh, the gravity of water, specific gravity, specific weight, specific weight of water. G is gravity. And, uh, and then we have um, some coefficients, which we will discuss later on. And this one in particular, CTC. It will be discussed in a moment. And uh, another, uh, another coefficient, which is uh, a, uh, so, um, it's CLC in the second relationship. Okay. And then we have uh, ALC, which is the longitudinal area of the ship, and ATC, which is the transversal area of the ship. And uh, what is... Uh, Vc. Vc is the velocity of the current. So for waves, the forcing was determined based on the square of wave height because it is the square of wave height, as I said, it's representative of the energy of the wave. Here we take the square of the velocity because again the square of the velocity of the current gives the kinetic energy of the current. So we have to discuss the coefficient CTC and uh, what is sin phi? Again, it's the angle phi, it's the angle between the main current direction and the ship center line as it was given before and uh, it is depicted in figure six. Look, when you look at the longitudinal component, there is no trigonometric component. Why is that? Because for uh, uh, the sake of uh, getting a conservative estimate, it is assumed that the longitudinal component is max. So the cos phi is assumed to be equal to one. And then there is uh, the rotational, the rotational component MTC, look, this is given by the transversal component times the eccentricity. I don't know how to pronounce in English. I would say uh, 
I mean, as, uh, okay, let me let me let me show you how it's written. Eccentricity. Now it didn't come to me before. Eccentricity. I, I would say that the pronunciation is this one, but we can check later on. And uh, this is uh, eccentricity is given. Can it be also written as the product of an eccentricity coefficient times the uh, length of the ship and here we take uh, the overall length of the ship okay just let me take notes okay now let's discuss the coefficients uh, so uh, ctc the first one which uh, is applied to the transversal component you see the subscript t it's a shape factor for the calculation of transfer currents it depends on the ratio of water depth ship drought uh, increasing as this ratio approaches one ctc varies from one for deep water and six uh, for unit value of the above ratio okay now clc it's another shape factor it depends on the geometry of the ship's bow it can vary between 0.2 and 0.6 the latter extreme being suggested for conventional bows has a conservative value okay ALC is the submerged longitudinal projected area of the ship exposed to current and ATC is the submerged transversal projected area of the ship exposed to current. I think that's it. Uh, eccentricity, eccentri eccentricity or eccentricity. It's varying usually from minus 0.17 to 0.17. It's a rule of thumb. Okay, I think that's it. Another empirical formulation. And uh, I, I guess that you are wondering what you have to remember for the exam about these empirical formulations. I will make a summary, so don't worry about that. Okay, now let's go to the final part impact of ships this is a kind of load that we have to consider we don't discuss it in detail because uh, i think uh, it is uh, another easy extension i don't want to charge you with too many empirical relationships it's uh, an accidental load that uh, you know it's due to the failure of a standard berthing procedure so there is something wrong in maneuvering the ship it may happen also under the effect of wind under the effect of currents and then there is a collision between the ship and the berth typically through the fenders and uh, it's an, uh, as i said it's um, um, an accidental law accidental law which uh, is uh, um, also called live load in some terminology and uh, how we can uh, we compute it it's quite simple we need to consider the energy of the birthing ship and uh, we can assume that the energy transferred to the birthing system is twice that which is computed for normal operating conditions so in normal operating conditions there are rules there are physical relationships which we don't consider we don't discuss to determine what is the impact of the boat against the berth through the fenders the reason why we don't discuss them is again that it's mainly based this topic this discussion on the use of empirical relationships which consider the typical velocity of birthing and compute the kinetic energy and through empirical coefficient they they transmit 
they compute the energy that is transmitted to the birth and uh, as I said it, it's uh, it's just one second because I need to turn the phone off okay thank you it is uh, it is um, I don't want, as I said, to charge you with uh, uh, a long set of empirical relationships and therefore, uh, and therefore this is why we don't discuss them. In the case of uh, accidental impact, we assume that uh, the energy transferred to the birth, as it's written here, is twice that that is uh, transferred in normal operating condition. Okay. I think uh, I think we can then close this part and uh, before we close with this web page I want to discuss two things first of all the additions that I made before this lecture during the last week and then I want to uh, discuss uh, what uh, we should uh, try to remember by memory or what we should try to understand in detail of uh, this part of the course. As uh, let me first start with the new additions. So, first of all, first of all, uh, in uh, these additions are basically rules of thumb which I added here and there to help you to assess. Uh, the orders of magnitude, which, as you know, I think are extremely important. Let me go to first here, guidelines for simplified assessment of mooring loads. This is something new, and uh, these are guidelines that may be applied for getting an order of magnitude, as I said. And uh, Let's start with uh, the case of design ships up to 20,000 tons displacement. In this case, each mooring point, as a rule of thumb, can be designed so that it resists to the following loads. Horizontal pull ranging from 10 to 100 tons, depending on on the ship and the type of, uh, of load that uh, is, uh, is uh, acting against the ship, if it's only wind, if it is uh, wind and currents, etc. So you see there is a huge range of variation and of course uh, the correct value within this range is to be determined by applying first the simplified procedures that I discussed with you and then the, um, the more refined procedures that we are not discussing but uh, that you can find uh, in the literature when we are called to carry out a final design. The vertical pool, it's, uh, as a rule of thumb again, can be assumed to be 0.5 the horizontal pool acting at the same time. I think uh, this is uh, uh, an interesting rule of thumb for uh, the getting an order of magnitude of uh, the loadings that each mooring point could uh, be called to sustain. Pull load should be considered occurring shipward at any angle with the berthing front to select the less favorable condition. Here there is a spelling that I need to correct. For the design of the birth structure, it should be assumed that load occurs at the same time in all the mooring points. So, when designing the body of the birth, we assume that in all the mooring points we have the same loading. Actually, this is something that may happen because usually when we moor the boats, we try to, to distribute the loading as homogeneously as possible. Um, the mooring points should be spaced between 15 and 30 meters. Of course, this depends on the size of the ship and uh, there is a range which is quite considerable, which it's, uh, I think, a useful rule of thumb. 
for design ships of more than 20,000 tons, the assessment of the mooring loads should be carried out by considering all possible forcings uh, and uh, uh, and then we turn to the discussion that we already had so when the displacement of the ship is relevant my suggestion is that uh, it's uh, it's not easy to make reference to um, a rule of thumb because uh, you know the loadings may be the loads may be indeed very very relevant and difficult to estimate but as an order of magnitude of course you you should assume that the ranges that are given here 10 to 100 tons for the horizontal pull could be exceeded so the order of magnitude it is in any case it's clear to you okay now, um, another addition that I did is uh, interesting, I think. It's uh, just one second, I'm going down to wind forcing. Here I gave these rules of thumb for computing uh, the area, side area, and front area. Okay side area is uh, um, the area of the side of the ship exposed to wind and this rule of thumb i think they are maybe interesting and uh, they are um, providing an estimate for these areas of ships uh, when you don't have of course detailed information so if you have to refer to an hypothetical ship then uh, you can take uh, these estimates uh, of course uh, they depend on the length between perpendicular and and therefore they depend in some way on uh, the length of the ship that you are uh, assuming as design ship and they depend also on uh, the ship freeboard and uh, and then uh, depends uh, on on uh, on uh, z which is mean height um, you know z and y are uh, some uh, uh, characteristic measure of the ship uh, which can uh, be assumed to provide relevant information for for computing the side and uh, transversal side and uh, and uh, transversal area and uh, so here in particular y and z are mean height of the transverse and longitudinal area respectively of the ship super superstructure above deck. I think this uh, relationship are useful, as I said, to give you a rule of thumb. And uh, and then let me let me take one note. And then let me go to the next one, which is uh, end of section 3.1, other rules of thumb. I think, yeah, this is something interesting and about the return period and uh, okay, here significant wave height for uh, the design of um, of uh, wave forcing and uh, first of all you remember from uh, the empirical relationship that we discussed that we are taking the significant wave height uh, has uh, a significant measure to estimate uh, the impact of waves uh, keep in mind that uh, we discussed uh, we said that this significant wave height should be estimated according to the procedures that you know for uh, uh, the estimation of extreme wave under a given return period okay but there is to say that this procedure and this is uh, specified uh, now here this procedure estimation estimation of the extreme wave height is to be applied when we plan for permanence in any 
condition within the port, within the harbor. So indeed, if you plan that the ship should stay moored in any condition, you have to design the wave forces, you have to estimate the wave forces by making reference to the extreme wave height. But there are some situations where you allow permanence of berthed ships until limiting conditions only. What does this mean? It means that when limiting conditions in terms of, uh, for instance, wave height are reached, then the ship is unberthed or other safety maneuvers are, are applied in order to avoid that uh, the ship transmits uh, to the moorings a very high load. So, in this case, uh, namely permanence until limiting conditions, the design wave height should be the wave height specifically defined as limit conditions. So you don't make reference at the extreme. You make reference to the limiting condition. In any case, you should uh, assign a return period. You should associate a return period to the design wave that you use uh, because uh, you may require it in cost benefit analysis. Limiting conditions are usually defined in terms of maximum acceptable pressure over the fenders, ships, hull, or others. So, a rule of thumb for limiting conditions and uh, are given here, again from the Spanish standard. So, for ships uh, with displacement up to 3,000 tons, a limiting condition could be for a pleasure craft uh, uh, wave height of 0.4 meters. For fishing ves vessels, uh, the limiting condition may be a wave height from 0.6 to 1 meter. For other types of ships, uh, it's uh, precautionary if you take uh, limiting condition of wave height of one meter. If you have ships with displacement greater than 3000 tons, you can extend the limiting condition to two meters. Again, I think this is uh, something that is useful for you to know because it gives an order of magnitude. You get an order of magnitude what, what could be limiting conditions and uh, for uh, which means that you know it means that uh, these are conditions uh, in uh, which in any case the permanence of ships becomes problematic they are condition w when the load on moorings uh, could be significant very significant okay now we had a long discussion on these uh, four things uh, coming from sea we discussed uh, almost all of them, uh, with the exception of uh, the forcing due to birthing. Now, there is a question, um, a question to be discussed, which is uh, concurrency factors, which we will discuss in, um, in the next hour. And uh, there is another question which is relevant to you, um, which is uh, what should we learn from this? What should we remember? And uh, what should we uh, study for the exam? And this is a relevant question because there is uh, something that is, uh, the majority of the information that I discuss with you here is not really physical, it's empirical. And as a rule of thumb, usually I give to students the suggestion to study in detail everything is uh, derived from physics through analytical uh, analytical proofs when it's possible to make uh, an analytical uh, an analytical proof to derive a relationship which we use for design my suggestion is to learn it 
because uh, learning an analytical proof doesn't mean learning by memory it means that one has to learn the concepts and apply the concepts and i am very interested that you students learn the concepts more than uh, more than the final relationship so when an analytical proof is possible i usually say try to learn it because it's a way to to learn the concept that is very effective on the other hand, when there are empirical relationships, I'm not really a fan of uh, learning them by memory because uh, it's, um, it's something that is forgotten after the exam and uh, it's, uh, it's something that it's not very useful to learn by memory. And I, I, I myself, I, I, I admit, uh, I frankly admit that most of the, of the relationships that I discuss with you, I, don't, uh, I, don't, uh, I didn't learn them by memory. I think uh, what you should uh, take as a suggestion for the exam is try to learn the concepts uh, even for analytical relationships and you don't you don't need uh, to learn uh, any single coefficient and uh, but try to learn the concepts like uh, I make uh, a few examples I discuss with you that uh, when discuss when uh, estimating uh, wave forcings uh, the relevant parameter is wave height because it's associated to energy, the energy that is converted into a forcing over the ship. So this is something that you have to learn and uh, something that I may ask, like uh, what are the physical, the physical uh, variables that we consider in estimating the wave forcing? So the physical variables are the area of the ship that is exposed to wave forcing they are the wave height, which is squared in order to compute uh, the energy. And this is something that you should remember, that energy is proportional to the square of the wave height. You should remember that energy is converted into a forcing. And uh, another thing that you may try to remember are the physical, uh, the physical variables that are uh, that are used to estimate the coefficients. This is a bit more difficult, so I, I, would, I will not be strict on that. But for instance, uh, if you remember the fact that uh, wave forcing increases for increases wavelength for uh, for a given uh, uh, for uh, a given reason, the same wave forcing may uh, have an opposite behavior for another reason. So wave forcing may increase or decrease for increasing wavelengths uh, for some physical reasons. So try to remember what are the physical concepts that we use. This is my, my suggestion. So I will never ask you at the exam, what is the relationship for computing wave forcing? But I may ask you, the typical question is, what are the physical behavior and physical variables that are effective in determining the wave forcing. And when I say physical, I mean not only the, the variables related to the natural processes like uh, wave height, but also the variables that uh, are related to the geometry of the ship. I, I hope that everything is clear. And uh, another typical question that I may ask you is uh, uh, terminology of the ship's size, what I included as a box, terminology of the uh, ship's dimensions, like what is the beam, what is, uh, uh, what is uh, the length between perpendicular, what is uh, the overall length of a ship, and uh, try to learn uh, uh, these uh, few terms uh, and because I think they are important. They are something that uh, you are an, an offshore engineer, so it's, uh, it's something that you have to learn. Some nautical terms, uh, you have to have them clear in mind. And then uh, let me browse this web page to see if there are other questions that I may ask you. I just would like to have a, a look at this and uh, wind forces ah, okay the wind rose so what is a wind rose uh, how uh, um, we can read it what is the meaning of uh, 
the numbers that you see in this figure i would like to this may be a typical question where i check your ability to present and then uh, uh, something on probability definition of probability this is something that i may ask what is a probability distribution something that i may ask and then not much more and uh, wind classification this is something that you don't don't do not have to learn by memory and um, what is a ballast is something uh, what is the ballast of a ship something that i may ask this is not difficult to explain and as i said here try to learn what are the physical variables that are effective and uh, and then there is the, the discussion on the return period and it, it is somewhere here um, a, a, a thing that i may ask is uh, what is uh, the definition of the return period and uh, what are typical return period for the design of uh, of um, of births and then okay design wave it's here so this uh, relationship this these are details that i may ask you what you see on the screen here and uh, also this uh, the meaning of this figure what is displayed here this is something i may ask and uh, and that's it these uh, rules of thumb usually i don't ask them but I may ask you some ideas of orders of magnitude, like, uh, can you please tell me what is uh, a wave uh, height uh, in order of magnitude for the max wave height that I could tolerate in a port? And the order of magnitude is, uh, you know, some meters, let's say, for large ships, uh, two meters, what you see here and uh, i may ask you some of these terms again uh, yo pitch uh, sway surge heave some some of these roll you know just because i think you need to know some nautical terms and then i think that's it because we are already talking about waves here so it's okay and uh, another question may be what about uh, wave forcing against vertical walls this is another one okay good uh, i think we can move to the next one then to the next uh, lecture do you have any questions so far I ask you because uh, I, I saw that um, with Professor Archetti you have through the chat a more frequent interaction. The chat is the same chat, so it happened to me that I took a look and uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, I should stimulate you to interact much more. And just feel free to tell me if you have any suggestion on my way of teaching. You know, I know that uh, there is. Uh, I have to ask for your patience and understanding because these are new lectures which I developed just recently and I planned to to be ready to deliver lectures well in advance but you know after after the situation came I was late but of course when you deliver a lecture for the first time and it's so always needs some adjustment for the next one will be also a new lecture but then I will take lectures which are already already tested from last year so i think uh, i'll uh, i'll have to call for your patience for some hours more and then i hope that it will be much better okay and um, i don't see any question on the chat but again if you have any critical suggestion please let me know uh, just on the clarity of the presentation on uh, the clarity of the web pages i really would like to get your opinion okay so i don't get your uh, any feedback so let me go to the next one the next one actually it's uh, placed one position before the lecture that we just discussed and this is uh, a lecture that uh, i put uh, i put before because uh, i think actually it should have been discussed uh, preliminarily because what we did what we just did is a lecture on forcing estimation 
And I think that uh, it uh, should have been preceded by a discussion of uh, port planning procedures and environmental impact. And, but I was not ready. I told you at the beginning, I was not ready to discuss port planning and environmental impact, or in other words, I was ready, but uh, it was not ready the web page. And I, I want to make an attempt to, when I teach, to have uh, supporting material that is already ready and, uh, and checked. So let's click on this, on the port planning and environmental impact. And uh, uh, just forget about this warning. This only uh, appears uh, in uh, the extended version of my website. And um, as I said, uh, this is also a new lecture, but it, it uh, takes uh, into account, um, it's a more descriptive lecture. It takes into account what is a very important phase of port design, which is planning. Planning and preliminary assessment of environmental impact. Environmental impact is becoming more and more a matter of concern, an important step in port design. Environmental impact assessment is becoming really important. And uh, I just wanted to discuss with you uh, briefly the topic uh, with a descript uh, descriptive approach uh, because I don't want to uh, to focus in detail on environmental impact assessment because it's uh, something it's very interdisciplinary so it's something that you have seen uh, probably in other courses uh, for what uh, is related to their discipline and uh, it as I said, it's very interdisciplinary, very dependent on local uh, laws in force. And therefore, uh, the discussion which uh, I am providing to you is a discussion that aims to give um, um, an overview of the problem, but uh, in order to give you the means to, to, in your profession maybe, to get the necessary information for environmental impact assessment. But let's... Uh, discuss uh, before environmental impact, uh, let's discuss what are the phases, the typical phases of uh, port design. And uh, the typical phases are what you see here in forms of bulleted points. There is, first of all, planning and uh, consultation with stakeholder. This is a truly interdisciplinary phase which involves uh, several disciplines and it involves uh, considerations on economics, commercial and touristic value of the port, the societal implications in general, because uh, you know, a port has a considerable impact on, on the land areas, on the surrounding land areas in terms of uh, traffic load, in terms of transportation, in terms of logistic, it's, uh, it's indeed bringing a considerable impact. With impact, I also mean benefits, but in any case, it involves a lot of changes. If it is an important port, uh, it involves a lot of changes, and, uh, and these changes have to be predicted and managed with the relevant stakeholders. There is also changes like pollution and uh, pollution, uh, which is uh, air pollution, pollution of the sea and the pollution due to road traffic, noise pollution. There are a lot of impacts that have to be considered with the, the stakeholders. The consultation of stakeholders is extremely important extremely important because, for instance, in Italy, it's prescribed by the laws in force. Again, when you assess the laws and the regulations in force for port design in Italy, there is also the consultation with the stakeholders if the port is important. And then once that we have made this planning, which again, I want to stress the key importance of logistics, logistics for the management of traffic, logistics for the management of ship traffic, and logistics for, uh, for the loading procedures. Loading procedures, uh, logistics is extremely important because, of course, we have to maximize 
the amount of the goods that we can store in a in a ship and in a truck when we unload the ship so logistics is extremely important it's not part of my course it's uh, usually it's uh, logistic is taught in uh, transportation engineering or system engineering and uh, but i just want to stress that it's uh, today a very important discipline in port planning once we are done with the port planning we go with the preliminary load estimation and the preliminary design of structures which is uh, what we already discussed and then we have to make the environmental impact assessment we have to get the approval of the preliminary design and then we can develop we can provide the final detailed design and uh, just one second i have a phone call which i have to answer to give me one minute thank you pronto pronto Here I am, I am sorry. And um, I, I'm going on five minutes before the mid-lecture break. And as I said, uh, um, as I said, after the discussion of these uh, uh, planning uh, steps, uh, one, one second, because I don't see, can you still see my screen? I hope so and if you don't see the screen just let me know okay thank you very much one second okay very good perfect i have to understand why i don't see it in, in my phone just one one minute because uh, i i really would like to to see it also on the phone because otherwise uh, i cannot see what you see so one second uh, okay let's see if i can solve this problem okay yes it is solved thank you for your understanding okay so let's let's uh, now discuss uh, the load estimation for births uh, and um, in general we had a detailed discussion of the loads uh, from the sea but let's uh, uh, now have a more general discussion on uh, the loads uh, which may affect a birth. And uh, let's first of all let's first of all divide them in three categories: loads from the seaside, loads uh, on the birth structure, and loads from the land side. And we already discussed the loads from the seaside. And in detail these uh, other loads uh, we will not discuss in detail but I just want to make um, a general discussion on 
on them. And uh, first, uh, what are uh, the loads uh, on the birth structures? And uh, first, let me make a premise. Loads can be divided into normal loads and extreme as accidental or live loads and uh, extreme accidental or live they may use as synonyms normal loads refer to any load that may reasonably be expected to occur during the design life of the structure and for instance the self weight is a normal load and uh, or another normal load may be uh, the load uh, can uh, be occurred during operations, operating loads. Extreme loads uh, occur only in exceptional situations. Uh, they are unfrequent and unlikely to occur at the same time unless there is dependence. For instance, the seismic load is usually considered to be independent of the wave extreme load unless there is the risk that waves are originated by earthquakes like tsunamis in this case there is dependence and they may occur together even if usually the wave load after an earthquake comes later, much later than the earthquake itself. You know that uh, there, is, uh, there is a time lag that may be even of several hours. So there is dependence, but still uh, we need to assess if they are concomitant, if they may be uh, concurrent. Extreme loads may be due to unexpected impact from vessels, for instance. We already talked about seismic activity, heavy storms, etc. And we need to introduce uh, concurrency factors that take into account uh, the likelihood that these extreme loads may occur simultaneously. As I said, what are the kind of loads on the birth structure, loads from the land side, which uh, we need to consider. I think uh, it is uh, very useful to make reference to this figure that you can see here. And my proposal now is, uh, uh, is to, to look, to leave the figure on the screen and then make a 15 minutes break in order to take a longer break so I take a coffee and you may also prepare a coffee if you if you like and uh, before I go for the break uh, do you have any question and uh, if you don't okay if you don't have any question I would like uh, to stimulate you after the break please uh, ask me at least one question with the micro and the question may be related to whatever you want, uh, to the lectures that we did, we had the exam, whatever. But I really would like to get a question from you. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, closing my micro and leaving my, my seat now. So if you want to discuss between you who is asking the question, you are welcome to. OK, and uh, so we will uh, meet together at 12.15 again. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, uh, because um, any any structure, any let's say elastic body, and the ship is uh, in immersed in a fluid that can be considered as an elastic body, as a typical uh, oscillation period, which is uh, the typical period that uh, if uh, the body gets impacted by a force generating an oscillation. Imagine like uh, you uh, take a pendulum and uh, you gave a force to the pendulum to the pendulum that gets swinging. And then there is a typical period of the pendulum and any elastic body as one 
period of the oscillation under a given forcing. So the ship, uh, in, uh, if you put a ship into water, let's suppose that it's calm water, and uh, you incline the ship, uh, for instance, uh, along uh, by, by giving a rotation to the ship along the longitudinal axis. So you incline the ship in water, and you suddenly release and leave the ship to go back to the stable condition. Then you get an oscillation because uh, after you incline the ship with a force, you release the force and then the ship goes back and forth until after a while there is attenuation of the oscillation. But uh, until attenuation, you have uh, for some time uh, the ship oscillating with a given period. The period is uh, uh, typical of the ship. It varies uh, depending on the load conditions. So a loaded ship with uh, a full loading has a different period of oscillation than the ship that is in ballast. So uh, once that you know the ship, the design ship, you can get information on uh, information on the oscillation period of the ship. So what is the problem? The problem is that when you get a single wave that uh, gets against the ship, a single wave is like a forcing that inclines the ship in the opposite direction. If it is just one, no problem. The ship comes back and then there is attenuation. If you have a series of waves, suppose that you have the first one, that is uh, hitting the ship at a certain time, and then the ship is, gets inclined and comes back. Precisely when it comes back in the dead, uh, in the opposite dead stage, dead means between uh, uh, an oscillation in a direction and the subsequent one in the other direction. If when the ship comes to the dead stage, you get a subsequent wave hitting the ship, then you have an amplification. And then again the next time, because if the period of the wave is the same as the period of the ship, at the next time you get again the wave hitting the ship at the dead stage. So you have an increase. This is resonance. Resonance means that you have a, a, a continuous increase of the amplitude of the oscillation, which is extremely dangerous, of course, because it can bring the ship to losing stability. And the same happens for bridges. Bridges have an oscillation period. They are flexible body. They are elastic bodies. And the same happens to, for instance, buildings, skyscrapers. They have a typical oscillation period. We know that. And if you have wind, which is hitting against the a skyscraper like uh, an harmonic which is unusual because usually wind is not oscillating but sometimes it may happen that you have winds that are hitting at a certain period then it may get dangerous and for bridges it's extremely dangerous for instance when uh, you have the traffic that is causing a periodical forcing if the period of the forcing is the same as the period of the bridge, then you get bridge collapse. This is unusual, you would say, this is unusual. How can traffic generate a periodical forcing? It may happen. For instance, it is known that when soldiers, that they march at a given frequency altogether, when they cross bridges, we say that they break the march, they break the pace of their walking, so they don't walk altogether, because there is a small chance that their period of walking, period of marching, is the same than the oscillation period of the bridge, and in this case, the bridge may collapse, even after the small loading of uh, 100 soldiers. So for waves and ships, this is the risk. The risk is that the period of the waves is, is close to the period of the ship. Of course, uh, the risk is mitigated by the fact that waves uh, usually get, um, get um, modified when they enter into the arbor. And uh, the arbor as well has a, uh, has a 
its own oscillation period, which means that if you induce one single wave at the entrance of an arbor, just one, and uh, you leave it going into the arbor, then the wave is uh, uh, is uh, practically is getting back and forth and is getting modified with uh, uh, a specific period which is a uh, characteristic of the arbor and uh, the risk is that uh, the arbor is not modifying the waves much and this happens if the arbor has a characteristic period that is closed to the period of waves so if the arbor doesn't mod modify the waves much and uh, they come directly from offshore and their period is close to the period of the ship then you get this kind of uh, of resonance. Can you please tell me if I was clear? Okay, perfect. Any other question? Okay, good. I can tell you that related to this question, there is one thing that uh, it's uh, it's new to me which is because you know i'm not making research in arbor engineering you know that i am making research in hydrology and uh, and arbor engineering for me is is a subject of teaching but i'm i'm not making research on that what is new for me it's the typical oscillation period of arbors i i it's something that i didn't uh, I didn't know before, meaning that I know that uh, waves, when they get into arbors, they get refracted, they get uh, reflected, they get diffracted. I know all of this. So I, I knew that the, uh, the arbor is impacting the waves in this manner. What I didn't know is that uh, this is aspect that I mentioned to you of uh, the typical oscillation period of the arbor. And it is something that if you would like to inspect and uh, by looking at the literature, I really would like to have a, a discussion on this because it would be also useful for me. Okay, good. Now let's, uh, uh, the screen is not, uh, yeah, it's already, it's already shared, yes. And uh, let's have a look at this figure. I think this figure is, is um, interesting because it's clear. And I took it from the reference that you see in the caption, but uh, I modified it. I modified it to simplify it a little bit and, uh, and also to make the terminology consistent with what I used. And uh, I think this is a clear sketch of um, the, um, the actions from um, the actions from the seaside birth and from landslide. So let's look at the seaside. Everything should be already known uh, by us. It's uh, from the sea, we have uh, waves. I look on the left, waves and ice pressure. Ice pressure is something that we didn't consider. And the waves, uh, we consider them. And uh, this is uh, an horizontal load, okay? So waves and ice pressure, they are horizontal loads. And then, uh, Again, in terms of horizontal loads from docking ship, we have ship ship impact and friction, and also we have the bollard forces. I hope you you I think you know what is a bollard, but just in order to make sure. And if you look at my other lecture, the previous one, there is a picture of a bollard at the beginning. I just want to make sure. I know that probably you know what is, but I just want to make sure that we are on the same line. This is a bollard, okay? Perfect. Let me now go to the previous page. And uh, ship impact uh, is something that we considered only, only very briefly. And then from the ship at the dock, we have the bollard forces, uh, and in particular, wind waves currents, we consider them. Vertical loads, uh, again, we have uh, bollard forces, this is possible which uh, means that uh, the vertical load uh, could be caused uh, also by, by wave action and uh, we didn't consider it. And then uh, we have uh, vertical forces on fenders given by friction, vertical friction. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, may be considered once that uh, we know 
the range of oscillation of the ship one that once that we know what is the range of up and down movement of the ship then we can estimate the vertical forces of fenders and also the bollard the vertical bollard forces and then the ice forces they can also have a vertical component and this is something that we discussed not everything from the seaside not everything because we didn't consider ice we didn't consider ship impact but basically this is the subject of the lecture that we already had now from the birth this is something that we don't discuss the horizontal loads are given by thermic dilatation i think uh, you got some uh, information on uh, thermic dilatation forces in structural engineering and then there are the cranes i hope uh, uh, you what are cranes let me show you uh, cranes are here just one second these are the cranes okay let me go back to the previous figure the cranes of course give a vertical load they may have also they may also give a um, um, horizontal load if they move if they move horizontally it would be a temporary load uh, sorry um, the cranes give um, I'm discussing here the horizontal load so indeed the cranes give a, an horizontal load and uh, they also give a vertical load which is under superimposed load you see on the right horizontal load it's uh, wind force uh, wind force uh, over the berth because over the berth you may have some tracks parked uh, anyway uh, areas that are exposed to wind and then uh, we have force forces against carbs uh, and friction forces uh, and uh, carbs uh, are uh, you know are uh, I I they are just uh, the devices that are used to uh, arrest the movement to stop the movement uh, of bodies uh, cars trucks uh, over the um, over the berth and uh, the friction forces again they may be originated by traffic uh, traffic uh, like uh, trucks uh, braking uh, or uh, uh, cars that are traveling over the berth the vertical loads are given by berth itself buildings superimposed load for instance uh, through through uh, cranes snow load and ice forces i see now that ice forces should be in red and i need to change the color i take a note change color to red okay and then let's look from the land slide from the land slide we have soil filling load on filling like if you have a, a car traveling or trucks over the field over the field soil uh, because you may have for instance a road on the land side which is a road is included into the soil filling and if you have a, a, a track traveling on the road then it translates in an horizontal load on uh, the berth from the land side and then there is the pore water load so water pressure and then you have uh, vertical loads given by superimposed loads and uh, soil filling i think as i said this is a nice uh, a nice uh, a nice figure that gives an idea of what is uh, of uh, what are the typical loads that have to be considered if you look at the type of berth that is uh, in this figure this is an open berth so you don't have any vertical wall that is uh, uh, that is um, beneath uh, the berth the berth is uh, founded is uh, is uh, supported by piles and in this case uh, you know the open berth has the advantage that you minimize uh, the wave impact against vertical walls 
the limitation is that usually the type of load the amount of load that can be it can be taken by an open berth is more limited with respect to a berth uh, which is uh, uh, founded on vertical walls what you see now let, let's now discuss how these uh, forces uh, have to be combined and have to be considered in the design first of all i am quoting here um, what i already mentioned to you and therefore the need for you to consider national and uh, uh, national regulation and international standard and this is something that i think it is uh, it is uh, very important for you to consider okay now I'm taking notes why I'm, I when I pause is because I'm taking notes so just one second okay now euro codes these are in Europe your reference and uh, I'm not discussing them in detail but uh, it, they are usually also taken into account by national regulations but uh, in case you want to refer to international standards, the euro codes uh, may be an interesting reference for you. Okay, now combination of factor of factors, combination of loads. Combination of loads would be a better title. So let me take another note. Okay. So a load combination results when uh, more than one load is acting uh, on uh, on the on the berth, um, and uh, again, how to combine loads is something that is usually regulated by the laws in force by the national regulation and international standards, uh, and. Uh, uh, load combination means that uh, you have to assign typically a concurrency factor when uh, when you want to consider uh, several loads occurring all together and uh, which means that uh, which means that uh, to, you give to each of the load uh, you sum the load but then you multiply the sum of the load by a concurrency factor also, uh, some regulations use uh, load factors weight for each load type uh, in order to ensure safety under unexpected loading scenarios. Concurrency factors usually are uh, lower than one. The load factors may be also higher than one. When, uh, when we want to introduce a safety factor, usually safety factors are introduced as load factors and may be greater than one when again there is the need to ensure safety under unexpected loading scenarios the dead load and the other regular loads are usually constant over time while live loads as we already said or accidental loads are temporary now let's consider these rules of thumb we are not exploring concurrency factor in detail i mean if you look at the national regulation usually they give you precise values for concurrency factors depending on the type of combination of loads that you are considering and these are very specific usually as i said your reference in this case are the regulations or the international standard but there are some rules of thumb which help a lot in my opinion to get um, an overall picture of uh, what is uh, the, what are the more the most likely concurrences and how to combine them so first of all there are a lot of loads potentially acting on a berth if we go back to the figure that is above you see that there are a lot of loads so it's a, a huge number 
but our experience suggests that these do not occur usually at the same time. In general, it's unlikely that more than two different loads occur together. And uh, in particular, if you consider the uh, loads that we studied in detail from wind, waves and currents, it's unlikely that the three of them occur all together. Usually it's just enough to consider the combination of two of them. I'm talking about, uh, uh, about um, accidental loads in this case. Of course, uh, if you consider a um, regular load, uh, this is always there. The dead weight of the structure is always there. So this is something that uh, must be, of course, taken into account. When you consider accidental loads, uh, like, as I said, waves, uh, etc., and uh, loads that um, are not occurring at the same in continuous time, then it's unlikely that uh, three of them may occur. Now, in each combination, in each combination that you consider, in each combination that you consider, only one live load should be considered to take into account, should be considered, sorry, to take into account that the combination of two accidental loads is unlikely to occur. So let's try to discuss a bit more on this. We can distinguish loads in regular loads and regular loads may occur always in time like the dead weight or they may occur not continuously in time like wave forcing wave forcing is occurring uh, almost all the all, almost all of the time but uh, with different uh, different uh, intensity of course and uh, if we talk about uh, uh, regular wave forcing then this is something that uh, it's uh, occurring all the time when you consider the, when you consider extreme wave forcing this is uh, an accidental load so when you go to the estimation of extremes uh, it's unlikely that uh, uh, two loads uh, should be considered entirely so when you get the uh, estimation of extreme wave forcing it's unlikely that it's, it occurs together with an extreme wind forcing. This is very unlikely. So it's likely that they occur together if you refer to regular forcing, but when it is extreme, then it's, it's unlikely that uh, they occur together. The seismic load is considered an accidental load. And this is important to be considered, meaning that uh, we don't consider the superimposition of the seismic load with an extreme wave forcing. Here there is a spelling error. Just one second. Seismic load. Okay, very good. Okay. Now, so these three rule of thumb, I think they are important try to remember them because uh, they give you the concept they give you a concept now about the design life um, we discussed it a little bit but uh, i think we need to give to say something more and uh, usually there is a again a rule of thumb which says that uh, birth structures should have a design life of 50 years of, or more but uh, there is something to consider which is counterintuitive when the birth are serving industries and when when they are serving important commercial activity usually we take a lower return period and a lower return period because because uh, we assume that these type of structures need to be renewed quite often because uh, you know the industrial activities usually undergo significant changes in a relatively short time so unless you have a, um, 
reason for being concerned by health risks. When you have concerns about the human life, your minimum return period should be, as we already discussed, around 100 years. But when uh, the impact of uh, uh, maybe a failure of the birth is not uh, causing a concern for the human life, but it's causing a concern for the commercial activities, for the break that we may have in the service, then uh, we can uh, adopt the design retour period, which is like some 50 years, even less if the commercial activity activities are intensive because as we say as we said we we know that these uh, activities uh, undergo significant changes over time uh, for flood protection works uh, the design life is increased uh, and it's increased because uh, typically floods uh, uh, are concerning for the human life and therefore uh, for uh, I mean, for flood protection, we usually increase the design retour period. Also, we have to consider that birth structures are highly exposed to corrosion, which may decrease the operative life. And therefore, when a structure has a, a shorter operative life, it means that uh, it has to be renewed. And again, we can lower the design retour period unless there is risk for the human life. And uh, a general rule, we already discussed this, I think, suggests that the design life should be adopted by considering the impact of a failure. We discussed this just now, okay? As I said, if there is risk for human life, the design life should be increased accordingly. Some rules of thumb for structures. So, if uh, we have uh, breakwater, Breakwater is 100 years, and the reason is that usually breakwaters are, are flood protections, and this is why you increase it. And if you have reinforced often birth structures, again, 50-100 years, depending if there is risk for the human life or not, and it may be lower if, as I said, there are commercial activities which are particularly intensive steel sheet pile birth structures 50 years and uh, concrete aprons and roads 20 years because uh, they are subjected usually to to corrosion and uh, to frequent maintenance again if there is no risk for the human life 20 years rubber fenders 10 years because they are frequently substituted and therefore it is really meaningless that you you put a fender with a design life of 100 years when uh, you need to substitute it after 10 years. So it's very unlikely that uh, a given rubber fender will sustain uh, an event that is, uh, that is, uh, that has a retro period of 100 years. And uh, given that there is no risk for the human life, it's better to, to pay the damage that is caused by a failure of the rubber rather than putting rubbers, uh, putting uh, fenders that have uh, uh, that are designed for a uh, 100 year retro period event. But again, consider the safety guidelines imposed at the national and international level. This is what we already stressed uh, a lot of times. Okay, now birth structures. It is uh, extremely important that you get an idea of what kind of birth structure you may adopt. And, uh, you know, the birth is, uh, um, the purpose of the birth is to provide a vertical front where ships can safely dock. And uh, keep in mind that usually we uh, have two types of births. We have the wharfs, when the birth is aligned with the coastline, and we call it piers when the birth is perpendicular to the coastline. Usually we use piers rather than wharfs because piers allows to, bet, to make a more efficient use of the coastal space. But in some situations we use wharfs, especially when we expect significant, uh, uh, significant currents 
which are parallel, which travel parallel to the coastline. This happens actually in many situations. And uh, when you see the presence of wharfs, it's very likely that they are they adopted the solution either because uh, it was simpler, because uh, building a wharf is simpler than building a pier. So for when the port has a small importance, may be a solution that is advisable. So if, when you see a wharf, it may be given by the importance of the port and another reason may be the presence of a long shore currents. Now, uh, in terms of structure, we, div we divide between solid structure berth and open structure berth. And uh, you mean, uh, I mean solid structure a solid vertical structure is created to contain fill material and uh, usually it's a wall and then you have to take into account the impact of waves uh, they, in any case you have to take into account uh, all the loadings that may come and uh, the corrosion that may come from the sea and act uh, over the berth Usually, open structure berths are more recommendable when you are concerned by these impacts. But uh, there is the problem that, uh, uh, that uh, the open structure berth, as I already mentioned, cannot sustain very significant loads. So you won't find open, uh, you will not find open structure berths in ports where huge ships uh, are uh, are expected to dock. In this case, in order to sustain the load of the huge ship, you need a solid structure. Solid structures may be uh, built by two type of uh, uh, approaches. We may divide between gravity wall structure and sheet pile. We already discussed what sheet pile is. The sheet pile structure may be uh, may be uh, put in place by using a concrete. In this case, you have first to drill an excavation and then put the concrete inside to create a sheet. And you can put iron in order to get uh, um, also to, uh, to increase the resistance of it. And the and in this case, it's a kind of gravity wall, but actually it's not a gravity wall. It's a kind of wall, but if you use concrete, it's a kind of wall, but it's not a gravity wall because the gravity wall is very massive and uh, it has uh, its resistance. Uh, it's based on the use of its own weight as a stabilizing force for the gravity wall. Instead, for the sheet pile, even if it's made by concrete, the uh, ability to sustain the load is given by friction, mainly by friction, or by the fact that it's uh, uh, a solid layer, a solid rock layer is, uh, is reached at the bottom of the concrete sheet pile structure. Another way of building the sheet pile is by using metals, by using iron, and uh, the sheet pile structure is largely used even for important ports because uh, the ability to, to carry load of sheet piles, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely, extremely uh, efficient, it's extremely high. The difference between uh, the choice uh, between uh, a gravity wall or a sheet pile is based on the consideration of the local conditions and ultimately on uh, a cost benefit analysis. But we will see the criteria for deciding the birth structure later on. Here you can see a picture of an open birth. And uh, again, you see it's a structure that does not lend itself to docking of large ships. It's uh, typically used in small ports, uh, in, uh, in, um, for touristic ports, uh, in uh, touristic places. So how can we select uh, the appropriate berth structure? These are the factors that we should consider. 
and uh, I am selecting soil conditions, underwater work, because, you know, carry out underwater work, it's always uh, expensive, it's always problematic. But of course, if we want to build uh, some type of uh, structures, important structures, we need to, to make some underwater works. The wave action is important, for instance, for selecting between the open berth and the solid uh, berth structure, the solid structure berth. And then the equipment that is needed to build it, the material that is to be used, because material has different durability and uh, different costs, the timing of the construction works, the future extension, possible future extension, and the cost finally. And uh, I think they can, uh, they are all, all self-explaining these. Uh, criteria to be considered, meaning that, uh, meaning that uh, you can understand uh, by yourself the importance uh, of uh, each of these, uh, but here there is a discussion. Uh, I am browsing the web page and uh, uh, I think it's interesting to focus on the material. You can use timber, steel or concrete. These are the most used and also we use combination and uh, the choice uh, depends on uh, several different considerations not only cost not only durability but also high aesthetic is important it's not mentioned here so for instance for tourism uh, and it's a, a also an important uh, an important thing not only for tourism i would say in any case but to minimize the visual impact of the structure because you know as we will see just in a moment the environmental impact of uh, of um, of pots is is uh, is quite significant it's also important as i said to constant the possibility that the birth may need to be extended for increased traffic increased uh, tourism uh, etc and uh, and also the final consideration is about costs, uh, which are another important driver, as well as environmental impact. Here there are some rules of thumb, which again, you know, I am a fan of rule of thumb because they give you the order of magnitude. So what is uh, the size, the typical size of a birth? The length may vary from 5-10 meters for small ports, small boats, to over 400 meters for large ships. You know that the longest ships have reached a length of 3-400 meters. The rule of thumb is that the length of a berth should be roughly 10% longer than the longest vessel to be moored. So keep it in mind. This is, I think, an interesting, an interesting uh, uh, order of magnitude. About width. The width of small docks should be at least 2 meters for a ship length up to 10 meters and the length of the pier or wharf up to 10 meters, uh, sorry, 100 meters, so at least 2 meters. But of course, if you increase the length of the berth, then the width should be extended. And uh, 2.5 and 3 and more meters. This is the minimum, okay? When possible, the berth should be aligned with the dominant wind because uh, it also means uh, dominant current. I am putting a note here. I have to add also dominant current. Dominant current, okay. And, uh, and then let's uh, talk about the structural load. This is another rule of thumb, four kilonewton square meter of live vertical load this is uh, uh, again a rule of thumb to give you an, an order of magnitude okay now in terms of uh, vertical positioning uh, just let's say that uh, we should make sure that there is a elevation different of at least uh, 
one meter between the birth floor and the mean sea level and uh, but of course uh, we may require more depending on uh, what is uh, the wave height that we are expecting and what is uh, the tidal excursion that we are expecting now environmental impact i decided to focus on environmental impact specifically because uh, i was told uh, from the Porto authority in ravenna that uh, its environmental impact is becoming for them a relevant uh, matter of concern and they explicitly said uh, that they would like to get uh, uh, from um, the young engineers uh, <coughs> a specific expertise on that because uh, it's becoming uh, important not only because uh, we want to care about the environment not only for that it's becoming important because uh, it is uh, the environment minimizing the environmental impact it's becoming a fundamental requirement for port operation and uh, i would like to give you <coughs> a more specific example <coughs> which is related to dredging sometimes we need for uh, for um, ensuring the operational activities of ports uh, we need uh, um, to to periodically carry out dredging of um, of the sea bottom because um, the presence of the port of the port causes the deposition of uh, of mud and the reason why there is deposition there is uh, uh, siltation deposition of mud is that uh, in the ports usually we make sure that uh, there is uh, a calm sea situation we try to shelter the ships and to slow down waves currents uh, to make sure that uh, the velocity of currents is reduced and to make sure that the wave height is reduced so there is a we want to avoid the wave breaking and so forth and this causes in this calm condition that uh, the velocity of water is reduced and the capability of uh, the seawater to carry suspended material is reduced as well and therefore you have the deposition of uh, the sedimentation of the suspended material and this causes uh, the accumulation of mud so periodically we have to dredge it and uh, dredging is uh, a problem because you have to displace the material and uh, sometimes we are not allowed uh, to displace the material offshore especially if the material is contaminated and uh, port pollution is uh, uh, becoming a matter of concern precisely also for this region for this reason sorry because uh, you get contaminated mud uh, settling down so the, uh, you get sedimentation of contaminated mud and uh, when you dredge it you have the problem to displace it you are not allowed to bring it offshore and where should we carry it so this is indeed a problem and uh, it's a problem not just because we care about the environment it's also a problem because we care about the environment but it's a problem just related to uh, it's a logistic problem we, we don't know how to displace the mud and if we don't dredge then we have the operational activity of the port that is interrupted so as i said environmental impact is 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 uh, becoming uh, more and more relevant and also we want to care about the environment we want to make sure that uh, what we do is sustainable and therefore we have to devise a solution for minimizing the environmental impact and this solution must be viable because it's it's easy to say that we need to minimize the environmental impact but on the one hand we cannot uh, stop activities the solution is not cannot be let's let's stop the activities let's not to make the port because this is uh, it's not a good solution because 
it has a societal implication. Usually when a port is built, it's not just for the purpose of making money for somebody, it's for the purpose of promoting the societal development in a place. So the no way, it's not a solution. The, the not to go, it's not a solution. So it's easy to say that we have to minimize environmental impact, but the practical way of minimizing it, it's not an easy question. It's a question with no easy answer. And also sustainability, we all agree that sustainability is important, but when we go to the technical solution to ensure sustainability, then, you know, the problem, the problem comes in because uh, it's not easy to find a technical solution. And this is our job. This is the job of the engineer. This is where engineers should introduce innovation. And uh, this is why the port authorities uh, came to us, university, and said, we need experts in environmental impact assessment because they know assessment and mitigation. They know that this is a job for engineers. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, um, uh, as I said, it's not an easy question. It's not an easy question to address. But still, I think, uh, still, for this reason, for the reason of its importance, we need to get prepared. Let me start by uh, uh, by try by trying to categorize uh, these uh, activities, uh, these uh, activities that cause uh, environmental impact. So the impact may be caused by the port activity itself, and uh, I mean, meaning that uh, besides uh, the other. Uh, the other reasons besides uh, besides the impact of the ships, uh, besides the impact from emissions from transport networks, besides the impact given by land use change, we have uh, what is physically done into the port, loading, unloading, that may cause an impact through, for instance, uh, release of uh, of uh, toxic. Uh, toxic, toxic uh, substances uh, from uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, emissions inside the port. So any impact by the port activity, impact on water, impact on the land, impact on air has to be considered. And then there is the impact on the sea. So pollution given by human induced activity human induced pollution and pollution caused by ships like release of oil and uh, release uh, of oil from the engine which is which occurs frequently occurs because uh, you know any engine uh, releases some oil exhausted oil and also you know the body of the ship causes uh, by itself an impact on uh, on, uh, on the sea, uh, an impact on uh, on the ecology of this of the sea, an impact on the on the, an impact on the fishes, for instance, and then we have the transport networks that cause emissions, cause uh, also uh, other types of impacts that you probably studied when you uh, when you studied road engineering, and then we have an impact caused by land use change, like uh, urban expansions supported by the presence of the port and therefore um, we have uh, several laws in force uh, which set up uh, guidelines to reduce the impact of port again uh, we have to make reference to national and international standards there is also there are some directives uh, of uh, from the european union if you refer to europe which uh, also promoted the European Union uh, an integrated maritime policy termed blue growth, which uh, you can find at the description in the link that is given here. It's a long-term strategy to support sustainable growth in the mar marine and maritime sectors as a whole. And uh, these regulations, these suggestions have to be taken into account for environmental impact assessment. As I said, uh, uh, national laws in 
in almost all countries give you indications, guidelines of uh, what uh, type of impact to consider and in some cases they have codes uh, that suggest you how environmental impact should be assessed. And also they may refer to, they may give you uh, solutions, uh, solutions uh, like suggested actions, uh, etc. And in some cases, the solution are economic incentives in order to, uh, to treat the wastes in a proper manner before releasing them, in order to reduce the CO2 emission, etc. Uh, there is one limitation, which is the lack of a global framework for addressing environmental impacts of international sh shipping. And, uh, we can say the same for planes. We don't have a global framework for assessing and addressing the environmental impact of this large scale international transportation. So it's difficult for individual countries to take an effective action on this because international transportation depends on several countries. It's a transboundary problem. It's a transboundary activity and therefore uh, it needs uh, the minimization of the environmental impact needs uh, um, an agreed concerted action by several different countries. Now I want to talk in specific about energy from the sea, something that you already know, and, uh, and uh, treatment of muds. But before I, I move forward with this, I suggest that we make a, a five minutes break. If you have any question, please let me know and then we take five minutes. So energy from the sea. I think uh, you did something already with uh, Professor Archetti and energy from the sea. I just wanted to uh, give to you an overview of what can be done to, to take, uh, to produce energy from the sea in ports. Because I think you mainly focused with uh, offshore uh, power farms. Power farms can be created also along the coastline. And uh, there are several technologies that can be used. Here you can see um, wave energy floaters setting at uh, the Gibraltar wave farm. Basically, these are, uh, these are floaters that go up and down with the waves. And uh, yes, please ask a question. I saw the chat, so you can you can step in with the micro or the chat as you want. Yes, in the part of ship pollution, we consider the waste and we consider the waste by ships and the waste could be uh, regular waste or accidental waste. Accidental is uh, is uh, related to the occurrence of an incident of uh, an unwanted situation like release of oil, unwanted release of oil, etc. And this is something that uh, has to be taken into account. Uh, and the regulations uh, may prescribe uh, to the port authorities uh, to set up emergency plan for recovering from uh, accidental release. And then there is uh, the regular release of wastes from boats. Usually this is uh, regulated as well. And usually we require that within arbors, uh, a regular release of waste is interrupted from the toilets, for instance. It's, uh, they are not allowed to release uh, while they are in arbors. And uh, there is also uh, the other uh, pollution that may come from the ship, from the engine, because as I said, the engines typically release some uh, exhaust oil and there is the pollution coming from uh, the emissions, emissions uh, from the boat. Uh, usually they use a diesel uh, engine, which, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, producing emissions. So these are uh, carefully considered. And uh, I would say that it's a classical uh, a classical procedure to consider them. It's less classical, what I, th I said about uh, the treatment of mats, and uh, I am also 
discussing it now and it's less classical the consideration of the indirect impact port activities traffic load etc but for the boats there is an extended literature and a lot of experience still when uh, some uh, inconvenience uh, inconvenient occur uh, um, which is an unwanted release uh, still uh, it's uh, very often it's an emergency situation which uh, which uh, causes um, relevant impact as i said energy this is one example and uh, i just wanted to to say that uh, producing energy from uh, the sea is a way to reduce the environmental impact this is just uh, the concept that i want to stress because we can use that energy to uh, to reduce uh, the emissions emissions uh, by engines for instance we can use electrical engines for loading unloading so producing energy from the sea is a relevant way of minimizing the environmental impact of the port now as i said the maths i already explained that uh, we need to dredge maths regular dredging is required and uh, a relevant problem is uh, the displacement of the dredging mud which is typically contaminated by highly toxic toxic pollutants including chemicals like heavy metals and uh, inland disposal is a possible solution i said that offshore disposal is often not a solution and inland uh, disposal it's a possibility but still uh, it's uh, a possibility that it's um, you know it has some problems because it's uh, not sustainable in the long term because you have to find disposals uh, places it can be disposed through landfilling but uh, this is a solution that is often not accepted by the population living close to landfill sites to reduce uh, the volume dredge mats may be reduced to dry solids via the watering this is uh, the classical solution for treating them but still uh, you know it's it's not a final solution because uh, in any way in any case uh, we have to displace uh, the resulting material which is uh, dry material with uh, reduced volume but still it's the uh, material that needs to be displaced and there is um, a large research activity on this topic and also some people try to use these dewatered mats for the production of concretes and construction blocks although although they have uh, usually a large a large organic content and therefore you know this may imply limited durability and uh, I'm quoting from Wikipedia with this sentence because I think is uh, precisely what I want to mean. The proper management of contaminated sediments is a modern day issue of significant concern. This is reported by Wikipedia, matches perfectly what the Porto Authority of Ravenna told me. Because a variety of maintenance activities, thousands of tons of contaminated sediments are dredged worldwide from commercial ports and other aquatic areas at high level of industrialization dredged material can be reused after appropriate decontamination a variety of processes have been proposed and tested at different scale of application technology for environmental remediation once decontaminated the material could well suit the building industry or could be used for beach nourishment but you know the problem is that we need the treatment we need the decontamination and uh, i'm not focusing on these techniques for decontaminating mats because they are typically the focus of other courses i just want to want uh, to tell you that this is indeed a very important topic nowadays okay i think uh, that's it even for this i am uh, very happy that it was uh, quite a long marathon but we could uh, come to the 
end of these two lectures. As I said, I, I, I need to make some edits around and we'll do that if you give me maybe a couple of days, probably less. Now, I would like to use this remaining more or less half an hour to, uh, to, to focus uh, on RStudio and our exercise. And then we will need to, uh, to continue it next time in the next lecture, next Tuesday. But for now, I uh, would like to start, I would like to start uh, uh, last time we had a look at the PDF of the exercise. Now I would like to do some more. Before I turn to our studio, I just wanted to know if you have any question. Okay, no questions, it seems. So let me, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, usually, uh, let, let me see, if you are busy, uh, I tell you, uh, my timing would be ideally, uh, would be ideally, yes, 1.30, yeah, you are right, so I, I was mistaken, uh, do you have time to move forward for 10 more minutes? Okay, okay, yeah, you are correct, it's 1.30, yes. Mm -mm. No, I, I, I was uh, a bit, uh, because I took two five minutes break, so this was why I was considering to move forward for uh, until, uh, until 45, but it's fine, give me 10 minutes, so I can just, uh, I can just uh, introduce the exercise, okay, so let me go back to our web page. And uh, again, uh, this is the exercise. I just wanted to tell you one thing on the PDF. I am downloading it and showing it to you just one second, because last time I forgot to look at the second page of it. And uh, yeah, it is here. The second page is useful because it gives you an idea of, um, of the angles that we have to consider. So if you look at um, this figure, Basically, we need to define what is uh, what kind of angle we consider between the a wave direction, which is the black arrow, and the coastline. Here, the sea is below the coastline, the land is above the coastline. So the angle that we define as the angle between the wave direction and the coastline is the acute angle so it's the angle which is called here alpha 2 in blue okay and uh, also the figures uh, the figure give you uh, some consideration on uh, uh, the other angles that we will consider alpha one alpha one is uh, the angle between the coastline and the vertical direction and also uh, alpha alpha is the angle between the wave direction and the vertical direction so it is important that we make clear that uh, what is alpha two which is the angle that we find in uh, in our, uh, in our uh, data file that I will open later. And uh, the other two angles, alpha and alpha one, are it's useful that we define for the development of our exercise what they are. So the convention that we have to use is this one. It is extremely important when you get wave data that you make sure on how the angle between wave direction and coastline is defined so what i uh, define here is the acute angle between the wave direction and the coastline okay good now we can go back to our page and uh, here there are two files geometry of the shoreline and wave forcing please save them and you can you can open them if you click just click 
and uh, the this is uh, the geometry of the coastline we already we already had a look at this file and the way forcing it's here no headings and uh, there is a description in the pdf which we already considered of the significance the meaning sorry the meaning of these numbers and these columns in particular and uh, you should save these files and i'm not sure whether last time we already uploaded them i think uh, probably not if i'm not mistaken i don't think we have okay perfect thank you because you know i need to make a, i need to remember what i did in the other course and what i'm doing here thank you very much for telling me and uh, so let's uh, save these files you can save the files uh, on the desktop it would be better if you saved them into a directory like uh, the directory exercises of the directory uh, arbor engineering so i am saving them on my desktop but for you i am assuming that you use windows it would be better if you saved it uh, in a directory in a specific directory other than the desktop so let me save it and the way to save them if you click with the right you can click on uh, save file as okay i have uh, the menu in italian i hope you can understand so i am saving it them and the way forcing let me save them okay good and then there is an example of an R file. <clears throat> if you click on it, in my system, if I click on it, it asks me whether I want to open it with R Studio, which is a nice opportunity. And if you get a similar option, select it. If you don't get this option, you can save the file and then in R Studio open it. And uh, what is this file? Let me open it in RStudio. But on the other end, let me, this is in RStudio. And uh, you, see, you see here that the file appeared in my script window. The file is, uh, uh, starts with coastline evolution. It's an adding. So let's suppose that you cannot open it in R Studio. Let me close it. And, uh, and then what you should do is save it. I'm saving in the desktop. And then you should start R Studio. Then you get R Studio without any script. And then you should find, you should open your script file open file i'm not sure whether sorry one second file yes open file perfect open file i go to my desk oh, sorry i i open the wrong file open file i go to my desktop and here i got it And here you get your script file. Good. Now let's uh, now load. Uh, let's load the data. It's just enough for me if we get to this stage. In order to load the data i suggest that for the geometry of the cost line we click on import data set from text and then i go to my directory be careful if you save the file in a specific directory then i suggest you that you go to that specific directory has a working directory. So what I would do before opening the data set, I would select the working directory in, uh, I don't remember 
where it's to be let me see let me see uh, okay edit back forward this is not here just one second because i will find it session probably uh, set working directory under session set working directory to source file location or choose directory let's choose directory and then i select my desktop open good and you see that in the console it appeared the command okay good now let's import the data set from text and then let's select the file cost txt and once that you set the working directory you should find it precisely when you open the window in the list now we have uh, this uh, this window opening we can just upload the file by clicking ok and then you got uh, the data uploaded in this way let's keep them there i am happy with it okay now for the second file and this is the last operation that i ask you to complete it's a bit of a problem if you use import data set let's try anyway because it's a bit complicated this file if you do this you see that it's uh, it's a bit uh, complicated and you see that there is a uh, an error the window says error row one doesn't have five elements so what's the problem here the problem is that uh, this uh, is uh, this file is unconventional it has a lot of information that is put there and the program is not able to decipher what is there actually we know what is there because 150 is the spatial step 120 is time step in seconds and 1000 is the number of simulations and then we know the meaning of each column but there is no way there is no enough flexibility in uh, in um, in uh, r studio to give this specification so better forget about this procedure because it's not flexible enough what I suggest you is to use the script, to use the console, the console with the instructions that are given in the script to upload the data. So let's go to the script then. First of all, the script has these instructions that just mean to give some parameters like sediment mass density of parameters or physical constant seawater mass density let's source it let's source them actually actually um, i didn't sorry let's uh, what i wanted to source only these lines let me see if i can if I can load only these lines because it loaded everything which is not a good thing but anyway it, it's not a problem we can make a cut and paste I just copy them and I paste them in in the console and I think in this way I pasted the instruction in the console and everything is now is now there in fact if you type d50 you get the value okay and then final instructions we need to scan the file cost txt this is uh, the instruction that i want you to copy and paste here in the console if you give uh, 
return you then see that it read 40 items i think we can stop here i just wanted to make this step forward uploading the data and i just wanted to tell you that now you have the script available in our studio and you can if you want as an homework to go through the script and see what we will do together next tuesday and see if you can understand what is the script about and you can understand the motivation of uh, of why i selected these instructions and this is up to you but in any case on next tuesday i will start from here to make uh, the exercise okay very good do you have uh, i i am fine do you have any question okay no question from muhammad no question from baran and uh, <laughs> no questions i i really would like that uh, you get more questions to me okay next time no problem so thank you very much student and uh, again if you have any any suggestion any critical suggestion i really would like to to get your uh, your uh, frank opinion on how it's going thank you very much uh, and um, have a nice week uh, and uh, if you as usual if you have any question on uh, on the, you have one question no sorry if you have any any question just write on the chat i am checking the chat every day very good thank you bye bye ciao